Um, thank you for sharing about your ways of paying respect to your parents. Um, Buddhism, the Buddha taught there are many ways to pay respect. And the first thing I'd like to talk about first is the four kinds. Um, not four ways, there's the, the four types to repay kindness. The unique uses to repay kindness to. The first one is the nation. Why would that be? Because they provide a security, provide maybe health benefits, um, a place for us, laws to protect us. Number two in line is actually our parents. Our parents are the ones who give us the food, they nourish us, they feed us, they listen to your joys, like that one, and let you play crazy and be who you are, and still believe who you are, even up to, when, up to whatever age you are. Next ones are teachers and mentors. There are a lot of people coming in our lives that are there to give us one lesson or a life lesson. And they come in different shapes and sizes. It could be someone at school, at work, or even here. Teachers and mentors. One, the last, last but not least, is actually our faith. It doesn't matter which faith you have, have in. Well, of course, in Buddhism, it would be the triple gem, the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. And it is this that gives us the guidance in our life, a spiritual guidance that brings us to another level. Our life as ordinary people, we sleep, eat, you know, play, work. That's our life. But on another spiritual level, it brings us to a different level. And that's why we're here. In a sense, to nourish our spirituality or our knowledge of Buddhism. And this is the faith that keeps us going. It's like a spark, or like a little fire that keeps, on, that keeps you motivated no matter what happens. To, uh, the Buddha mentioned that these are the four types that we should pay respect to. So I said, it's like, how do you repay back to your nation? Well, of course, paying your taxes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and that would help. <laughs> um, Following the traffic rules, that would be helpful. The parents, we talked about different ways that we can pay our respect. Calling them, listening to them talk on and on and on, and sharing with them, and our teachers and our mentors, um, being thankful and being taking their words and putting it into action. So filial piety is not only to parents itself. The Buddha mentioned it, it also is not only to like Master Xing Yun, Founder, he says it's also to his disciples to master, children to parents, um, students to teachers, and uh, between family itself and friends. It's about respect, actually. That's what family love is. <laughs> it doesn't matter what tradition you can all do something to help each other out. And of course, um, there's in the beginning when I um, talk about the West and the Eastern, there's actually, there's no difference. It's about, actually, Antoinette actually mentioned the ethnic, ethnic way of family. And actually, before this, I was thinking about filial piety, and I was thinking, oh, only the Chinese keep the family together, but not. The Greeks, Italians, Aboriginals, family bond is important. So it doesn't matter what country or such or ethnic. And I was talking to um, some students, and I was saying, in the 20th century, they call us to be independent. I'm on my own. I can do everything on myself. And it actually breaks our bonds further apart. Um, because if you look at traditional ethics of all societies, majority of societies, they tell us, talk a lot about family and supporting each other. And so the 20th century actually puts us separately. It says, yeah, you can be independent, send your parents to the nursing home, um, call them once in a while, FaceTime them, whatever. But we forget actually how family actually is just as important. And so there are different ways, of course, to show a family. Yes, different traditions, 
touching the feet, offering of flowers, some offering of tea, whatever. Right. No small kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. So even a smile to your parents, friends, your mentor, very important. Actually, I should change that because I should, what can I give back to not only my parents, my teachers, but people that, to repay respect to? And the Buddha mentions actually in the sutras about there are three levels of filial piety. As a very young man, his name is Uttara, and he went up to the Buddha, he went to listen to the Buddha teach. And he asked the Buddha, he says, he says, I'm a very, I, I follow, I'm very moral, I follow the rules, I should respect my elders, and I continuously serve my parents, excuse me, is there any merit in that? And the Buddha answered him, he says, yes, anyone will gain merit. However, paying respect for filial piety, there are three levels. Number one, do you provide support to your parents, giving them food, clothing, material support while alive, but including up to death? This is the very basic and the, the beginning level, filial piety. Number two, is building a successful career or building a career to honor the family name in order to, and also providing material, more comfort to family. But the highest level of field piety is actually introducing and guiding one's parents, teachers, and mentors towards right view. Right view, right faith, right perspective of life. And in this case, it's based on the Dharma. So they can be relieved of their own suffering. We all face different challenges in life, and I'm sure they do too. And if they're able to receive something that is wise, or if there's something that can open the key, the door to something, to relieving them of that distress, bringing them that to what we call happiness or peace, that is the greatest filial piety. And of course, on the Buddhist path, it is not only that, it's much more beyond. It's bringing them to, letting them to uh, bring on the path of the Buddhist path to practice. And one day they attain Buddhahood or even transcend so-called rebirth, of suffering themselves. So something to ask, your, ask yourself, so which one do I do? Do I only provide food and, and money and just you know, feed? Or do I go and um, try to make them proud of who I am by letting them feel at ease that my child can support themselves, I don't have to worry so much. They're happy, they, can, they may be sick sometimes, but they can manage, and they do care about me. Or the last one is, they not only care about me, but they provide me wisdom, provide me something that I can help me overcome everyday challenges in life about whether mental challenges or physical challenges to make my life even happier and at ease. Three levels. Nothing you could think about. I'm going to provide examples just of how Buddha exemplified filial piety. So that this is what he, his example for as Buddhist is a way of how, just an example of, look, the Buddha, when his father, when Buddha attained enlightenment, not long after he returned to the Jetavana monastery. And he gathered his disciples and went back to the kingdom and stayed there for three months. He gathered, he talked to his father about what he had gained enlightenment on, his sharing, what experiences. And for three months, staying with his father, his, his stepmother, and so forth. After three months, he, he left, of course, continuing on his teaching for the next 45 years. And then one day, the king, Sudadana, 
He sent his minister and told, to tell the Buddha, he said, I am dying. I'm very sick. My last wish, wish is to see you. So that's what he did. He went back. And the first thing he did was he heard the news and said, let's go. Um, only a few of us will come with me and we're going to go straight back. And that's what he did. He went straight back, went to his father's side and stayed with him until his last breath. And um, his cousins and his stepbrothers were crying. He, he, the Buddha was not crying. He was sad, but he knew about life, the reality of impermanence. And he said he will carry the coffin. He will be the pallbearer for his father. And so he was the one in the front, of course. It's a Chinese depiction, but he is the one who offered to carry his own father to a cremation. So he shared his joys and enlightenment. He was also there for the very last, last part of his life. Not only his father, of course, his mother. After seven days of his birth, his mother passed away and was reborn into Tusita heaven. Now, he never got to see his mother, speak to his mother, technically. And so one day, when he, after his enlightenment, he had a chance. He went up to Tusita heaven to speak the teachings of Tusigarbha, Jen, Jen, <laughs> sorry, as mentioned, Tusigarbha Bodhisattva, the great vow. And he went up there to talk about it and explain the Dharma, sharing the joys and the achievements that he has realized, and giving him right views and ideas to inspire them to, to move on even much spiritually. And his disciple, Mudgalayana, this is famous, we all, we all celebrate, we don't celebrate this occasion, but this occasion is celebrated every Sangha, Sangha day, this lunar July, Ulambana festival. And Mudgalayana well, has supernatural powers, he could see very far away, he could see everything. And he saw his mother in distress. Now he's, and his mother was in distress, so he saw his mother was, looks very, skinny and needs food. So he made an offering to food, but every time she tried to eat it, it, it turned into fire. And she couldn't digest it. He tried all different types of ways, and he didn't know what to do. So he went up to the Buddha and says, what can I do to save my mother? And the Buddha says, well, what you can do is make um, offerings on behalf of your mother. He says, make offering to the Sangha community monks and nuns. Because the monks and nuns at that time, they were on retreat. And so a lot of them were not only enlightened, but they were practiced. Their mind were very pure and calm. And so those, by making an offering them, that merit is greater than an ordinary person who might use it to only feed their body or use it to do something else, such as some drugs or something else. So he said, make an offering to that. So every year, you celebrate that. Um, not his occasion, but to remember that occasion and of alms possessions. And it's done on that day. So, Mudgayana, finding ways to help. And after that, he saved his mother in the offering. His mother was able to receive the food and uh, he was able to um, speak to his mother and, and about the teachings that he learned. And his mother listened because she was happy and at peace. She listened very carefully and she made some realization she was reborn again. That was about the Buddha and his disciples. Now, now coming to Venerable Master. A lot of people, actually it was recent, yesterday, as the day before, I was interviewed by the high school students about me and my relationship with my family and friends. And I told them about my master. My master, at 12 years old, he was he left to become a monk. And um, he would write letters to his mother whenever he had time and send them mail. And then when he went to Taiwan when he was 21, he lost contact with his mother due to war and also doing too far, far away. It took about 40 to 50 years of search for his mother. One day, he had a chance. His disciples went out to look up to his mother, and they met the first time, I think it was in Japan, 
in the airport. And then the second time, they actually, he was able to go in back to China. He was blacked out, blackmailed out to China for a bit, and then he was allowed to just visit her. And when he visited her, they have conversations, and he would feed her, just as a mother and a son. And um, provide her as much as he can. He sent her to our temple in Los Angeles, where there's better food and water and care, just to be looked after. And to him, his mother is his support. And it was her who let him become a monk and let him go to become who he is today. So um, every year, my master doesn't like celebrating his birthday. We don't celebrate our birthdays. He says monastics don't celebrate birthdays. But we celebrate our parents' birthdays. So on, the, on his mother's birthday, or on actually he uses because he can't remember his mother's birthday, and he, she doesn't remember. So on his birthday, a Sangha day, uh, in, in Foguan Sangha headquarters, he would gather all, he would celebrate his mother's birthday. And one year, he gathered all the six-year-olds coming in to celebrate together with him, and just to show that his respect, not only to his mother, but to the elders. That he wanted to show that, yes, this is what we need to do in return to our parents and our elders. And so he's done that since when she, it's as many times as possible. It might be rang true for you parents. We never know about love our parents for us till we have become parents. And you don't have to be married to have children to know understand that. When I um, when you become a teacher, um, I look after the Buddhist college. And being a um, and Buddhist nun, we also have sometimes have to take care of other people's children. <laughs> and then you realize, yeah, being a parent is not easy. <laughs> you can, when you have a chance, you can ask our abbess monk. Uh, she said when she arrived here not long, there was a, a couple who were in a divorce matter by court order. So they were separated. And the children, by, or by law, by court, we're not allowed to stay with the parents until it's decided who can have the children. So who get to be the care caretaker? Abbas Manko. <laughs> <laughs> the venerable took after the children. And how many kids were there? I think there was two or three. And she had to drive them. She was young at that time, in her 20s. So she could drive them to school. And she's the one who signed them out after school every day and took them back. And to the doctors and everything. And up to, the, to, the, to this day, uh, I believe the kids still remember. It's, it's the, not the mom, it's the nun. <laughs> it's the nun who took care of them from school to sick days. Even uh, when they were uh, called by teachers, teachers, um, teachers meet, not teachers meeting. It's like um, when, you're, when they were naughty, you get suspended or in trouble. Who shows up? The nun. <laughs> not the mom, it's the nun. <laughs> And then it shows up to show that, yeah, I'm, I'm responsible for the kids. What can I do to help? Yeah, so we learned that um, all children is our children. All parents are our parents. Right. Very sweet. Even animals. It's very sweet to look at animals, too, because they actually show the kind of love between parents and children. I want to share this one, last but not least. Um, my master talks about family. He uses his mother, he doesn't use his mother, his mother as an example. He also believes that as monks and nuns that we should not cut our ties from family. So I keep in contact with my family through email, through phone calls, Skype, and sometimes WhatsApp. And um, we have a family gathering every two years, and this year is our big family gathering. And all the monks and nuns are allowed, because there's too many of us, so there's one allowed. If it's your parents, only your par you're both your parents and one or two siblings. And they all come back. And it just shows that we don't cut off our ties. Not what traditionally people think. The Buddhists are detached. They live up in mountains. They don't care about family, friends. No, we care a lot about our family, friends. But we learn to help them and help ourselves. And as... At, and especially when you go to funerals and watch nuns pray for their family and how they face it. 
Yeah, of course they do. There are some that have tears. There are some that who are strong, who are at much more at ease. And then when they if they didn't know in how the Buddhist ways of how to learn to watch their parents let them go. And so I think um, at least Master Shingyu has taught us at least taught me a lot that um, we're human, and so we learn how to learn to be thankful. So. When we go back, if we don't have our parents that go back, um, people will take us in as their family. So my because my parents were in Canada, and um, I was in, my classmate asked, well, "Where's your parents?" I said, "They're far, far away." Well, be part of our family, and they would take you in. And so this is my mom, my mom, and my dad, and my sister, and you become their family. And there is no, there's no difference between who we are. There goes two moms. These are the moms in rescue. <laughs> That's what moms do. <laughs> All right. So family. And for the last part, um, I'd like to share with everyone. I thought we could pay, say a prayer to our parents, our family, and our friends, and to our teachers and mentors as a way to say thank you. I do pray to them every day. They're always in my mind, and I thought we could do something together. And if you don't believe in Buddha, it's fine. You could say God or whoever. And if you don't mind, we will. Sir Pops, Reverend Jordan. All right, we'll read it together. A prayer for our parents by Venerable Master Xing Yun. Great compassionate Buddha, since I emerged from the womb, my parents have raised and educated me. My relatives have supported me. I have received so much from them, but seldom repay their kindness. When I cried, they gave me joy. When I was frustrated, they gave me encouragement. In each requirement of livelihood, they gave me protection. Through hardships and setbacks, they gave comfort. They have given me so many expressions of kindness and loving words, so much tenderness and consideration, yet I hardly ever repay them. My parents, especially, have taught and admonished me with patience, have raised me through all possible hardships. O oh Buddha, you once carried the coffin for your father. You also once traveled over land and water in order to teach Dharma to your mother. Please bless and protect my parents and relatives. May they enjoy happiness, longevity, good health, and a peaceful life. May they be safe and at ease. Great compassionate Buddha, please accept our sincerest prayer. Namo Sakyamuni Buddha. And I wish all of you a happy Buddha's birthday and a happy rebirth day to you too. Today's his birthday, and I hope you have a good birthday too.